in my heart. In today's China, the masses have no idea what architecture is. Some regard it as bricks and tiles. Others assume it is carved beams and painted rafters. But the true meaning of architecture lies in its function, firmness, and beauty. Unless our society understands architecture and acknowledges architects, architecture will not develop in China. Therefore, you have the obligation to communicate our mission to the society and to guide the people to achieve such an understanding. You will be the forerunners of China-made architects. As a new ship breaks into the water, you carry with you great responsibilities and a grand future. Lin and I both congratulate you upon your graduation, and we hope that you will continue to work to establish a new era for Chinese architecture. In 1931, Liang Sicheng returned to Beiping from the northeast to face a new career choice. In the early 20th century. Chinese architecture featured both Western buildings and classical Chinese buildings. Foreign architects occupied the stage when Chinese students started to go overseas to study Western architecture in the early 1900s. Within a short period, these students returned to China and made splendid achievements. Back then, two famous architectural companies. Quan, Chu, and Yang architects, and Allied architects, were established by architects returning from the U.S. Thus, in the 1930s, Beiping, Shanghai, and Tianjin all witnessed a blossoming of architectural firms. Because at that time, the 像他们这种从美国留学回来，那可以做得非常好，收入都很高的。But in 1931, Liang Sicheng took a different route. He was determined to blaze a new trail in Chinese academia. He began from scratch to study Chinese architectural history in order to create a system for the study of Chinese architecture. 但是毕竟你现在回头看，他学了建筑，这真是对我们一个。呃，民族文化来讲是一个万幸，就是说，做成了这样的事情，就他有这种，他有一种责任心，他这个责任心是超越了很多一般的当时其他的知识分子的。尽管我们讲其他知识分子，他都有这个爱国啊，这种理想，这个都有，这个价值取向是一致的，但是程度是有是有差别的。也就是当你在做命运的抉择的时候。你这个天平倾向于哪一边？这个时候是，是一个程度的问题。Liang Sicheng was motivated by a mysterious sealed book. In 1919, Zhu Qichan, an official in the warlord government of North China, came across a hand-copied ancient book, Building Standards, in the Jiangnan Library of Nanjing, with an imperial mandate. This book. A masterpiece on ancient Chinese architectural design and construction was officially compiled and edited by Li Jue during the Northern Song Dynasty. It is the equivalent of today's architectural design manual. In ancient China, construction work such as home building was called yingzao. The art of yingzao was traditionally considered to be craftsmanship. Which was to be orally passed down by masters to their apprentices. Hence, it was rarely preserved in the written records. Zhu Qichang, always fascinated by ancient Chinese architecture, was overjoyed to discover this masterpiece of building standards. Zhu Qichang served as Minister of Transportation, Minister of Internal Affairs, and even as Deputy Prime Minister. During this time, he presided over numerous urban planning projects in Beiping. We now know that the city has two roads. In the 
，是他开始栽种的，主要街道种的是槐树，护城河的两边种的都是柳树。我们现在看到的中山公园，就是他创办的，天坛呐、啊、颐和园呐、啊、景山呐、啊，都是他在任的时候对群众开放的。In addition, Zhu also presided over the opening up of Chang'an Street, connecting the southern and northern ponds in central Beijing, the construction of the railway around the city, and the transformation of Zhengyang Gate. For Zhu, the book building standards was a heaven sent gift. However, no one was able to decipher it. In 1925, Liang and Lin in the U.S. received a copy of the book from their father, who wrote on the cover page, "Zicheng and Huiyin treasure this." I received the book soon after it was published. At first, I was happily surprised, but then I fell prey to disappointment and unhappiness. This beautiful masterpiece turned out to be a sealed book, and I could not understand it at all. The book, Building Standards, was sent across the ocean to reach Liang Sicheng, and it would remain in his company for the rest of his life. Liang Sicheng's goal was to decode the sealed book. In 1930, under the auspices of the China Education Foundation and with Zhu Qicheng's personal funding, the Institute for Research in Chinese Architecture. A private research facility was established. The study of Chinese architecture has enduring historical and aesthetic value. In an increasingly interconnected world, remarkable developments have been achieved in various fields. However, Chinese architecture, lacking systematic study guided by a scientific spirit, cannot be presented to the world for open scholarly discussion. Liang joined the institute in 1931 as director of construction methods. Another key person who joined the institute at this time was Liu Dunjun, who had graduated from Tokyo Polytechnic University. Due to Zhu Qicheng's influence, they attracted notable talent from academic, political, and financial circles. With their support and work, within a short period of time. This private research facility achieved brilliant results. Chinese architectural culture is a very important culture. But the Chinese people have not studied it in a scientific way. Why is Chinese architecture different from Western and Eastern architecture? What is the reason? I don't know. Why is Chinese architecture so big and so high? I don't know. Why is Chinese architecture 屋顶上还有那么多装饰，也不清楚，甚至于名词都闹不清楚。And Liang, as as you know, his concern when he came to the West and、uh, studied all the all the periods of、um, historic architecture from the West, which are very highly documented and Recorded, and you could look at you know the plans and the elevations of all of these buildings, you know, from the beginning.、Um, he lamented the fact that there was nothing like that in China, that there was no history, that emperors, when a new dynasty came in, they tended to destroy everything, any records from the old dynasty or whatever. So there wasn't a continuous, there wasn't a Western history of Chinese building, and so he, I think. Determined as a student that he would try to correct that. Where to begin to decipher the mysteries of Chinese architecture? Choose the front of the Jin Chen, Wu Gong. That time, the Jin Chen student's house was in the Jin Chen Palace, which was in the secret corridor between the two of us, which is now the Guoqi Ban. Wu Gong was Qing Dynasty. Qing Dynasty was in the Jin Chen Palace. There were some old soldiers left behind. Liang started from Qing architecture and the old craftsmen who knew Beijing of bygone days to delve into the profound mystery of ancient Chinese architecture. Building 有什么样子？屋顶底下为什么叫斗拱？斗拱是什么样？柱子为什么叫有檐柱、有金柱？
一点一点拿着书请教工匠，一点对一点对，弄清楚了，慢慢弄清楚，入门了。In 1932, Lin Huiyin wrote, "Chinese architecture claims an independent system in Oriental architectural history. Despite its long history." The evolution of Chinese architecture hinges upon a clear line of the ancient legacy. The basic structure has been free from radical change induced by foreign influences. The latter development of Chinese architecture exhibits a structural complexity and exquisite artistic achievements, while remaining simple and pure in form on the exterior. It was easily mistaken to be underdeveloped and thus inferior to other architectural systems. Foreign research made few contributions to the study of Chinese architecture, leaving much space for Chinese architects to work. We had to collect data to conduct valuable research so as to bridge the gaps and right the wrongs. In 1934, Liang published his first monograph on Qing architecture, entitled. Qing structural regulations. Li Huiyin wrote the introduction. This book was only the first step in their lifetime's work to construct a history of Chinese architecture. As Liang Sicheng was making steady progress in his research, he became aware of competition from rival researchers. At the